see uh, every one of you here. Um, I'll be talking about my PhD project titled The Emulated Ensemble, and it's about the simulation of musical instruments. And uh, just to give you a brief idea of what that is, I would like to start with a, a quick demo that also serves as a sound check. <laughs> Sound works. Um, so this is a uh, simulation inspired by the hurdy gurdy, which is a very interesting instrument that I'll come back to uh, later. Um, and it's made using a sound synthesis technique called uh, physical modeling. And physical modeling is uh, a way to uh, simulate uh, something in software uh, based on its physical processes. So, for example, take a guitar. Uh, we can mathematically describe how the strings vibrate, how the body vibrates, how they interact with each other and then uh, simulate these, these mathematics or these equations uh, into software and then get our virtual instrument out of it. So uh, why would we do this? Uh, first of all, we can create dynamic audio plugins. So audio plugins used by music producers, most of them are still based on samples or recordings of the original instrument. And, um, but these are very static. We need to uh, record, for example, in the case of the violin, every combination of bow force, bow velocity, position along the string in order to capture the entire instrument. Um, if we instead simulate the instrument, we can control all of these parameters on the spot, on the fly, and the sound gets generated. So you're not linked to these recordings or specific playing styles of, uh, of the player. So um, yeah, physical modeling is more dynamic than samples. There's also little storage required, so we just have to store the algorithm. We don't have to store an entire library of sound samples. Um, it is, though, more computationally expensive to, uh, to generate the sound than to simply play back. Um, but we have the processing power currently available to run these uh, simulations in, in real time. So secondly, uh, we can also resurrect all the rare instruments that are maybe too vulnerable to be played, uh, and samples might not even be available. Uh, so most of these instruments might live behind uh, museum glass, not available for anyone to play, but we can use physical modeling to resurrect this, uh, these instruments and bring it back to a general, uh, general audience again. Um, and uh, thirdly, we can go beyond what is physically possible. Like now that the simulation is uh, virtual, we're not restricted anymore by the laws of physics. <coughs> so we can change uh, material properties or the geometry of the instrument uh, on the fly. So imagine bowing your violin and then morphing it into a cello uh, while you're playing it. And this can also extend the range of expression for the musician. Think about a uh, pitch bend knob on a keyboard where you can uh, tune the strings of your piano uh, on the fly, which you can't, or very hard can do in, uh, in the physical world, but now digitally you can. All right, so how do we then physical model things? Um, if we take a look at the string, first of all, uh, usually when we plug a string, this is very uh, enlarged, of course, it follows a, a motion that goes uh, kind of like this, like this corner moves along the string uh, as follows. And there are several methods that we can use to, uh, to model this. And uh, the first method is uh, digital waveguides, where uh, we assume a traveling wave solution. So we have uh, two waves traveling to the left and right, and their superposition, or if we add these together, we get the state of the string um, in the end. So this is one method. We can also use uh, modal synthesis. So we decompose the original vibrating string into its uh, modes of vibration. And all these modes will resonate at different frequencies and at different amplitudes, depending on where we plug the string. Um, and this will eventually, uh, the addition of these will result in the eventual uh, string state or the string motion. Um, and thirdly, we have mass spring systems. So uh, this assumes that the string can be decomposed into a series of masses connected by springs. 
And then uh, we can simulate this, and over time, the, the masses get pulled down or up by these uh, springs, depending on their state, and we get this motion as well. And finally, there's finite different side domain methods, um, where we now, from a mathematical equation, we discretize that directly and get a similar motion uh, here. And this final method is what I use uh, for, my, uh, for my project, um, mainly because it's very general and flexible in terms of the systems that it can model. Um, so we can model nonlinear systems, time varying systems, which might be very hard to do uh, with other techniques. There's nearly no assumptions, so traveling wave solutions are not assumed. We can, uh, there's no assumptions in this, uh, with this method. Uh, it's also very modular. It's relatively easy to connect a string to a body with uh, uh, these finite difference methods. Um, but there are some concerns about stability. So for a wrong choice of parameters, your system can explode which is not so good for your ears. Um, but um, yeah, but we can circumvent this, or at least we can uh, uh, calculate the conditions uh, beforehand and then simulate afterwards. And uh, also, um, when compared to other techniques, it might be a bit more computationally expensive. But again, we have the processing power uh, that we can uh, run this in real time right now. Yeah, so one of the challenges of physical modeling is to run it in real time. Like usually when you have a complete simulation of your musical instrument, you press play, and you wait a bit, it buffers, and then finally we get our sound back uh, out of that. So that's very important. Yeah. So that's one of the challenges. Another one is control. So the real musical instrument is very expressively controlled. We, um, we interact with the sound generating string or membrane on the drum directly, so we can also be very expressive with it. Whereas with a simulation, using your mouse and keyboard, it might be very hard to be expressive. So this is another challenge with uh, physical modeling. Um, so yeah, my project objectives were first of all to real-time implement several physical models, um, to then expressively control them, and finally to uh, explore to what is possible and use the full potential of physical modeling to go beyond what is physically possible. <coughs> Great, so let's dive a little into finite difference methods. And as I said, it directly discretizes equations, and these are uh, called partial differential equations. So uh, say we have the 1D wave equation here on the, on the left, which models an ideal string, but we have a state u here, which is defined over space x and time t of a length l here. And this basically says that the, uh, the acceleration of the string is uh, depending on the curvature along this string. So there's forces acting on the string due to curvature, and then we get uh, the motion of the string uh, out in the end. And if we then use finite difference methods to discretize this, we essentially subdivide our continuous domain into a series of grid points, discrete points in space, and also discrete intervals in time. So we can see on the left that the system is continuous, and on the right that it goes in steps, in iterations. Um, so if we take a look at, it, for example, a continuous guitar string, we can basically subdivide this into a series of grid points, and then, uh, for example, if we plug it here in the middle, this uh, point will go up, and then the next iteration, its neighboring points will go up, and its neighboring points, et cetera, to get this, this wave uh, propagation. So usually the process to implement physical models in real time using these, uh, these methods is first to take a partial differential equation or a system of these, discretize these using finite difference methods to get a finite difference scheme. Then we can implement this in a software such as MATLAB, uh, but as MATLAB is not necessarily good for real-time implementation, we can rewrite the code to a C++ uh, using the JUICE framework, for example, which I used a lot. Uh, and then we can think about how to interact with these uh, now real-time models using more expressive control. And uh, what I will talk about mainly during this presentation is the systems, the partial differential equations, and then give demos of their real-time implementations. So we don't have to go through all the derivations. Cool, so we've had the introduction, and then I want to show some instruments. So first of all, I want to show the dulcimer or the Santur, for which we need uh, some theory on uh, how to model a string and how to model a body. Um, then we can add a bow to it, and we can get the hurdy-gurdy, which we saw at the beginning. Um, and then we have all the components we need to model the trauma marina, which is a very interesting instrument. And finally, I want to move towards the trombone, uh, for which we need uh, dynamic grids, which is what I will try and focus on a bit more, uh, as that is one of the main contributions of my, uh, my PhD project. Um, and then finally, I'll conclude the presentation. Great. So, the stiff string is uh, defined by this equation, this partial differential equation. And here on the left side, you can see the 1D wave equation, where the acceleration is due to uh, tension, first of all. And then there's a term due to stiffness. So we get, in a real string, we get something called uh, frequency dispersion. 
So uh, higher frequencies travel faster than lower ones, and this yields inharmonicity, which happens in real strings. Um, also what happens in the real world is damping. So the sound dies out over time, higher frequencies earlier than lower ones, and um, then we get a sound that sounds like this. Like a string. Great. So um, I can actually show you immediately a real-time demo of a uh, simple implementation of the SIP string. So as soon as I click it, we get the sound back. We don't have to wait for anything to buffer. Uh, we can also hear that we plug in the middle, we get a different sound than if we plug at the edge, which is also the same as in, uh, as in real life. So yeah, this was the string, the first component that we need. Then we can move on to the instrument body. So how would we model that? So what I usually did during the project is to model it using the thin plate model or the Kirchhoff model, uh, where the acceleration is now uh, to only due to stiffness and due to damping. Uh, and secondly, it's in two dimensions. So now we have uh, a two-dimensional plate where we excite it in the top left, and then we can see these waves travel outwards. Um, and that sounds as follows. So very metallic. Um, but we can also tune down the stiffness and maybe turn up the damping to get more a wooden sound, which we can use as an, uh, as an instrument body, a simplified instrument body. Um, and then now that we have the string and the body, we can connect the two using a uh, connection. Um, so we can extend our equations using this uh, connection term, where f is the force due to the connection. Um, and we can see how these uh, systems now interact. You can see that the wave travels to the left, reaches the connection, and inserts its energy into the body. Uh, so now we have two interacting components due to this, uh, this connection. Cool, so now we have everything we need for uh, the hammer dulcimer. This is a very interesting instrument. It's kind of like an, uh, an open piano where there's many strings that are tuned in pairs or in triplets. And uh, they're slightly detuned with respect to each other, so you get this nice chorus effect, which you also get in the piano. Uh, and it's played with hammers in your hand. So I wanted to quickly show you a, uh, an example of that. So yeah, that's a, that's a dolphin or a sampler. Um, so in the implementation, uh, we chose to have 40 strings uh, tuned in pairs and one body, so one plate, and one in each pair is connected to the body for a slight detuning and this kind of chorusy uh, chorusy uh, effect. Um, and then uh, to expressively control this, we can use the sensor morph. And I have two of these here on the table, and there are these uh, very expressive controllers that have around 20,000 pressure sensitive sensors in them, uh, where it can map the x, y direction, and also the z, so the pressure, to uh, whatever application that you make. Um, so the mapping that we did for the hammer dulcimer is to have 10 string pairs per sensor, and then the force with which we tap is linked to the hammer force, and the position along the sensor is linked to the hammer position along the string. So um, I'll show you a demo of that too. Mm. Oh, let's see, there we go. Very nice. So it's kind of like a harpy sound if you like put the hammers like that, but tap harder, softer. The sides of the string or in the middle, it's different sound. So you can be quite expressive with these controllers uh, using, uh, using the sensor for these real-time uh, applications. Great, so uh, moving towards the hurdy-gurdy, we need uh, a model called, or the bow, uh, friction model. And it's very interesting because when applied to strings, we get this stick-slip behavior, or what is called a Helmholtz motion. Uh, so there's this, this corner of the string that moves around as we uh, play, play the string with the bow. Um, and we can have a slow motion video of a, a bow string where the bow is moving to the left. And at the beginning, we can see kind of sporadic or random uh, behavior. But uh, soon enough, this, this motion will start to appear. Um, this corner will go around, uh, go around the string, which is the uh, characteristic Helmholtz motion for uh, a bow string. And um, in, in time domain, we can plot this, and we can see this kind of sawtooth-like uh, motion. And this is very characteristic for bow string uh, instruments. So let's then try to model that. Um, we can apply this to a stiff string by uh, adding, or rather subtracting, uh, this term where uh, we have here at the beginning, we have some term that uh, this term is position along the string. Uh, then the second one here is force. And finally, we have a nonlinear friction characteristic, which is dependent on the relative velocity <coughs> between the bow and the string. 
So here we have the bow velocity. Uh, and this characteristic looks like this, um, which is a nonlinear function of the relative velocity, which in the end creates this stick slip uh, behavior. So if we take a look at the simulation, we can see that uh, here we bow on the, on the left side, uh, we can see that the string, sim, string sticks to the bow, <laughs> and we get this uh, kind of sporadic behavior at the beginning. But then after around three seconds, we can see that this, this Helmholtz motion appears, and this corner moves along the string. Um, and we can also plot this again in time domain. Uh, and we can see here that at the beginning, it's kind of uh, un unstationary, and then in the end, we get a stationary signal. And we can uh, listen to this. So yeah, if we zoom in at around three seconds, we can indeed see that we get the sawtooth-like motion, which is what we predicted in the first place. Um, so yeah, then we can also map the sensor to this, and uh, the way we did that is to map the position to the x direction of the sensor. Uh, the force with which we press on the sensor is mapped to the bow in force, and then finally we have the velocity of the of the bow, which is linked to how fast you go up and down uh, the sensor. So um, let me show you that too. Softly at the edge or harder, and also inside different different modes of vibration depending on how fast or how hard. Like all these parameters are nonlinearly interact or, or interacting to get this behavior. But uh, yeah, so we can very expressively control this. And what I found through the project is that this allows you to tune the parameters also way better than just having a static MATLAB implementation with just a set uh, amount of parameters for here you can actually control them in real time and this also helps uh, in development. Um, great, so now we have everything we need for, uh, for the hurdy-gurdy and it's, an, uh, it's a bow string instrument um, as you might have guessed by now uh, but instead of having a bow in your hand it has a, it has a rosin wheel that the player can crank on the side and you can put strings on the wheel and put them off to get different uh, uh, different scenarios. Um, and then there's various string types. We have here three melody strings with which you can uh, play the melody using a few buttons on the side of the instrument. Uh, a few drone strings, so these keep on having the same pitch throughout, uh, throughout playing. Um, and finally there are some th sympathetic strings that resonate along with the rest of the uh, instrument. So these are not played, but these are uh, uh, just there to add resonance to the system. So you can hear the drone strings, they continue to go at the same pitch, but the melody can be, it can be changed. So it kind of sounds like a, like a bagpipe, and that is what it's uh, inspired by <coughs> sound-wise. So in implementation, we just have five bow strings, two of which are drone strings, and uh, three of which are melody strings. And uh, all of these are bow. And then we have 13 uh, sympathetic strings here on the, uh, on the right, and all of them are connected to uh, the body of the instrument to uh, get the energy from the bow strings that you play through the body to the sympathetic strings uh, in the end. Um, and the mapping that we chose was to have uh, the left sensor be divided in five sections. So we can uh, put a finger on one of these sections and then we can put a string on the wheel. And the average force with which we press on the sensor was linked to how fast we crank the wheel. So not the bow force, but the velocity rather. Um, and then the position uh, is mapped to the wheel position for each string individually. So in the real instrument, we have one wheel position for all the strings. Uh, but here now, because it's a physical model, we can change the wheel position for each string individually, which is, uh, which is nice. And then finally, we have this nice uh, keyboard overlay that we can use on the sensor uh, to play the melody, to play these buttons that we saw in the video before. Um, so yeah, I want to show you a demo of that. I hope that it works because this one tends to break. <laughs> ha! Call it. Yes, give me one second. <coughs> yeah, okay. So, um, without the melody, but we have uh, five bow strings, we can have two drone strings here, which are tuned in A and E, and then three A, E, A. And depending on what strings you bow, various strings will start to resonate along that have uh, 
um, the same frequency as the string or the same frequency as the string's harmonic series. So A, A, E, D, all of these strings will start to resonate along with these, uh, with these uh, bow strings. Um, so that's very interesting because that also happens in the real world, but now this is a nice uh, side effect of having all these strings connected to each other um, virtually. Great. Uh, yes, let's go back to this. Yeah, so going briefly back to the bow, uh, there was one other bow model that I used in my project, which was the elastoplastic friction model, that uh, assumes that, there's a, that the friction is due to a large number of bristles between the bow and the string. And um, in one of the contributions, uh, I applied this to a SIP string uh, using finite difference schemes, where here now the uh, bow force is dependent on both the relative velocity between the bow and the string, but also on this average bristle displacement, uh, Z. And um, the results of this was that we got a hysteresis loop. So we have this loop in the force versus velocity plane, and this is also consistent with measurements. So this is a more uh, physically correct uh, bow model as such. And also in time domain, we get the Helmholtz motion here, albeit a bit uh, smoother than, uh, than the other, um, probably due to the, the addition of the bristles. So in conclusion here, uh, there's a very large parameter space. There's a lot of parameters to tune. Um, and small changes in these parameters already yield large differences in behavior. So um, after this project, I decided to go back to the static friction model before, uh, because it's more uh, yeah, robust as such and more predictable. Great, so let's have a, uh, a brief experiment. Um, I would like to show of hands who thinks that this is a bow string instrument, and afterwards who thinks that this is a trumpet-like instrument. Who thinks bowed string? Who thinks trumpet? Everybody does. Nice. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trauma marina. It's actually this instrument right here. The answer was right in front of me. Um, and it's a bowed string instrument that has a very special uh, rattling bridge or a shoe, which uh, resonates along with, uh, with the string as we bow it. And this creates this trumpet-like uh, sound, or this trumpet-like timbre. Um, and the way that we play this instrument is uh, using uh, harmonics, using the knuckle and the finger. So we can bow above the damping finger above, uh, below, and the finger needs to be at a half or a third or a fourth of the string length to induce these, uh, these harmonics. Um, so I quickly want to show you a, an attempt at making a melody using this tromba that was uh, built by Peter, by the way, he's in the back. So it's ridiculously hard to play. Uh, <laughs> but at least we get this kind of brassy-like timbre from a bowstring string instrument, which is, uh, which is very interesting, and therefore also very interesting to sing it. So uh, the, the instrument, and thus also the physical model, can be decomposed into three main elements. Uh, we have the string, uh, the bridge, and then uh, which is modeled as a mass string system, and then we have the body, um, which is a model <coughs> as a plate. And there's a connection between the string and the bridge, and then we uh, allow the bridge and the body to, uh, to collide um, using a, a collision function. Uh, so we can take a look at an animation where we have the string, the bridge, and the body here. And the body is also visualized there where it collides with the bridge right here. So if we, uh, we let it play, and we can see in a minute that the string will move the bridge down onto the body, and the body will start vibrating uh, as, a, as an effect. Great, but instead of using this raised cosine to excite it, we excite it with a bow instead. And then finally, we also have to add this uh, damping finger um, to, uh, to induce these harmonics. So um, for control, we map this to the sensor again, uh, using the first finger that you touch the sensor with uh, mapped to the bow, uh, the same way as uh, I was shown before. And the second finger is linked to the, the pitch or the harmonic inducing finger. Um, so yeah, let me let me show you that too. We have the string at the top, we have the body at the bottom, and we can have a close-up of the bridge right at the at the right side. And if you move this finger, you get when the finger is at a, a third or a fourth. Of the uh, so these these gray lines that you see in the top are where the harmonics are supposed to be. Uh, 
So for example, one fourth, we get this rattling, and everywhere in between, don't really get it. And then here, one fifth again. So yeah, this is uh, the, the trauma marina in real time. Um, and then um, we extended this project to a virtual reality, where um, now we use the Phantom Omni, which is this device, um, which is a force feedback device, and it, uh, we link this pen-like thing to, uh, to the bow, and uh, there's uh, six degrees of freedom, and three of which, here denoted by A, can give uh, force feedback or vibrotactile feedback, and the other three are just for control. And this was to have a more uh, true um, interaction paradigm to the real instrument, because you don't bow the real instrument bending down over a sensor, but more like a, a motion like this. So for control, we link the Omni to the bow, and then uh, an Oculus Rift controller, which is part of the VR uh, set, to the pitch of the, uh, of the instrument. Um, yeah, so this is uh, me trying to play that in VR. <laughs> Rattling, uh, rattling sound. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, great. <laughs> cool. So uh, <laughs> those were uh, those instruments, <laughs> and I want to move towards the trombone. Uh, first, presenting a method that I developed during the PhD called the dynamic grid method. And um, so the, the motivation behind this was to go beyond what is physically possible. So uh, being able to change parameters on the fly and uh, making sure that the system is still stable and doesn't blow up. Um, so yeah, the real-time changes in material properties and geometry, uh, which we can now do, uh, hopefully, in the future with, uh, with this method. Um, and there's, of course, also this real-life example of the trombone, where the geometry of the acoustic <coughs> does change while playing. So this is a nice case study for the uh, dynamic grid method. So um, if we recall this slide, uh, right now I want to focus more on the, uh, the technical part and the implementation of things, um, just so you're ready for that. <laughs> so let's start by the one, with the one-year wave equation. We can discretize the partial differential equation to the finite difference scheme like this. And we can see here that our continuous domain is subdivided into n equal intervals or sections, um, meaning n plus one uh, grid points with which we can describe our system. Taking a closer look, we have the, the distance between two grid points, which is expressed as the grid spacing H, and then the, the time between two iterations is expressed as K. And this spatial temporal grid is related uh, to the wave speed through a stability condition. So we can see here the wave speed C times K over H needs to be smaller than or equal to 1 in order for the system to be stable and not blow up. Um, so if this uh, stability condition is satisfied with equality, uh, we get an exact solution uh, in the case of the one-year wave equation uh, to our problem. Um, if it is smaller than one, so still satisfying the stability condition, we get uh, something called numerical dispersion or numerical error, um, which also results in a lower bandwidth of our uh, simulation. And then if uh, lambda is larger than one, uh, we get unstable behavior. So uh, there's a disproportionate uh, uh, power from one grid point to the next, and we get an exploding system. <laughs> so ideally, we would want to have uh, lambda equal to one to have an exact solution to our uh, to our problem. So usually, the way that we do this is to rewrite this uh, condition in terms of the grid spacing, because we know uh, what wave speed we want to have, and we know what uh, what our sample rate is, and thus our time step, our iteration step. Um, so what this shows is that for a large wave speed, we need to deal with a larger grid spacing, and thus fewer points. Uh, for a smaller wave speed, we can have more points. And we can kind of have, use the analogy of tuning down a guitar string, where if we tune it down, we add more material, and thus we add more grid points to the system. Um, so for a lower wave speed, lower tension, we have uh, more grid points available to simulate the system. Um, yeah, so now the question is, if we want to uh, move from one setting to the next, how are we going to do that? How are we going to add or remove grid points uh, to the system that is already running? So, uh, yeah, we have to devise a method to smoothly add or remove points from the system. Uh, so usually these calculations are performed in order. So we uh, calculate the grid spacing using the stability condition with equality. And then from this and the length, we, uh, we calculate the number of intervals that we can subdivide our system into um, and use this uh, flooring operation here because this needs to be an integer. Um, then from that, we recalculate the grid spacing and from that our current number, uh, lambda. 
Um, but what we propose in, our, uh, in, in the contribution in the paper is to have a fractional number of intervals. So somehow allow for a fractional number of sections that we uh, subdivide our system into. Um, and then we also don't have to floor this, we don't have to recalculate the grid spacing, and this means that our lambda is equal to one, which is what we wanted to have in the first place. So how do we have a fractional number of intervals? We first split uh, the original system, now called Q, into two. We have U and W, um, and there's here one grid point for, uh, for overlap that is used as a starting point. Um, then we set the outer boundaries, uh, which are these guys, to be uh, fixed or directed boundary conditions, and the inner boundaries here are uh, connected in a certain way um, that I'll uh, talk about now. So we can uh, expand these inner boundaries. Uh, this offset is just for clarity. Um, we can see that the update equations that we get if we expand our finite difference scheme um, has virtual grid points or undefined grid points at the, uh, the edges of the domain. So we need um plus one, which is here, and u minus, uh, w minus one, which is supposed to be here. And these are called virtual grid points. Um, and the way that we can define these is to set these equal as a starting point to uh, the state of a grid point in the opposite system. Um, so if we do this, the two systems are connected, and we can see that also in this animation, um, where we actually get identical behavior to the original system. So this is good to use as a, as a starting point, as I said. Um, but then if we want to decrease, for example, the wave speed C, this decreases the grid spacing according to this calculation that was shown before. Um, so we, here we have a grid, and uh, I propose to fix the outer boundaries and move all the points to their respective outer boundaries. So the grid spacing decreases when we get this, this motion of the grid points towards the, uh, the outside. So if we zoom in, we can now see that if we do this, these virtual grid points no longer align with the point of the opposite system. So we need to find alternative definitions for these. So uh, what we propose in the paper is to use quadratic Lagrange interpolation because it has very nice uh, properties, as we will see soon in the results, um, where we calculate essentially the state of this virtual grid points using surrounding state values. And we do the same for uh, W minus one. And here alpha in these equations is uh, essentially the fractional part of our fractional number of intervals, or how many times does the grid spacing fit in between the inner boundaries. Um, so we can take a look how this works. So here now alpha is a half, and we can see that the systems are still connected, um, but we can see some dispersive effects happening as the wave travels through this uh, connected center point. Um, but as we will see in the results, this is still an, uh, an okay, okay behavior. Um, so yeah, if we decrease the wave speed even further and the virtual grid point surpass the inner boundaries, we need to add a grid point somehow. Uh, and for this, we use cubic interpolation. So we can use the surrounding grid values again, to now add a new grid point to the system. And um, this can be shown like this. So uh, we decrease the wave speed even further and now add a grid point to uh, system U. And if we decrease it even further, we add a grid point to system W and do this in an alternating fashion. Um, removing points happens through simple deletion. So if we increase the wave speed instead, uh, the grid spacing increases as well. And then the grid points need to be removed at some point. Um, but a problem that arises here is that at the point of removal, it might happen that these inner boundaries are not approximately equal to each other. So they might have a very different displacement right here. And this is also very unphysical. Like if you have two uh, parts of the string that are very close together but are very far apart like that, um, this is very unphysical. Um, so in the paper we say that we have an artificial spring force between these two uh, inner boundaries. Uh, which gets stronger as these points move closer together uh, in the x direction. Um, and this spring force also uh, introduces damping or has damping, which we will see soon in, uh, in the results. And this, this is also to uh, reduce the number of artifacts that we get when, uh, when removing points. So uh, if we decrease the wave speed, we can see here uh, some results. If we decrease it from 15 intervals to 20 intervals, we can see that, uh, or we decrease the wave speed, which corresponds to these values, you can see that the frequency here uh, quasi-linearly decreases for lower modes, but for higher modes we can see these frequency deviations happening, uh, which corresponds to this dispersive effect that we saw before in the animation. Uh, but luckily these effects happen in higher frequency ranges, uh, so they are slightly less perceptually relevant than the, than the lower frequency ranges. And we can also take a listen to this uh, if we go from 50 to 600 intervals, 
Um, in two seconds, we can hear this sound. So quite a smooth transition from one setting to the next. We also don't see any artifacts happening. Um, but of course, we need listening tests to confirm that this is the case. Um, if we go the opposite way, we now turn on the displacement correction. So we damp. Uh, the effect that this has is that it damps the higher modes uh, before they kind of disappear above the Nyquist limit. Um, so we can also take a listen to that um, if we go from 50 to 600 now. Uh, using this displacement correction, and we hear the following. It's kind of an inverse of what we heard before, uh, which is great, which is a great, uh, great result, and we don't see at least any artifacts uh, happening. So in conclusion, um, an advised method to dynamically and smoothly change grids, which allows for time-varying parameters in the future. So future work includes listening tests to uh, confirm the absence of these artifacts, uh, to prove under what conditions the system is stable, so how fast can we change the grid back and forth. Um, and we can also um, then apply it to other systems, so for example the stiff string or the thin plate that we saw before, or uh, maybe also nonlinear systems, which might be a very interesting use case. Great, so now we have everything we need for the trombone, um, or at least the dynamic grid. Um, so as I said, it's a perfect case study for these dynamic grids um, because of this time varying uh, length. Um, and the only difference here is that the change is in length rather than in wave speed. So instead of fixing the outer boundaries, we fix the entire left system. And if we increase the length, we move the right system to the right um, as follows. And of course, to the left if uh, L is decreased. Um, so yeah, let me show you a demo of that. So here we have um, our trombone geometry, so in orange. Uh, here in a minute we will see two different states of the system. So we have a green state and a blue state, which is the pressure or the velocity of the particles in the system and the uh, pressure in the system. And then here below we have a control panel with which, uh, with the mouse we can control the length of the tube and the lip frequency. So I can decrease the lip or the the length of the tube like that. And I can also increase just or decrease the lip frequency without changing the tube length to hit different resonances of the acoustic tube. So I can. As you would also have with a real instrument. Um, I can change the pressure as well, so turn down the pressure or turn it all the way up. And um, yeah, so, so these control, um, this, this way of controlling with the mouse, uh, in the future work, it's still, uh, we might want to include a breath controller to more uh, expressively be able to control this. Um, and maybe even in virtual reality to have your controllers extend and contract the tube. Um, but yeah, that is, uh, that is for uh, future work. All right, so um, we arrive at the conclusion of the talk. If we recall the project objectives, uh, which is to real, in real time implement uh, these physical models to expressively control them and to go beyond what is physically possible, um, we can conclude that I showed a few uh, real time implementations of several instruments. Um, which could be expressively controlled using these various controllers, such as the, the Omni and the Sensor. And uh, the first steps towards time varying parameters were taken um, with this dynamic grid method. And uh, future work includes to uh, improve the realism of these uh, simulations. So right now we're just retrieving the state at a single point of the system, but in reality uh, a lot of the string vibrates, so it's not just a single point along the string. Um, also we could maybe have some reverb, that always helps. <coughs> Um, so yeah, the, the realism should be improved. Um, also evaluation, we did some uh, user studies with the, uh, the virtual reality trauma marina, which uh, confirmed that the, uh, the haptic uh, feedback was very natural and the visuals and the audio and the haptic feed force each other. Uh, but for the other applications, we uh, mainly did technical evaluation, so how fast does this code run, uh, and informal listening tests, but uh, more evaluation could be done. Then, uh, of course, the dynamic grid to find stability conditions for that uh, to apply it to different systems, as I said before. And of course, there's always more instruments to model and um, older implementations to improve. So, uh, yeah.
I wanted to end with a, with a brief thank you to uh, my supervisor, Stefania, and uh, Stefan, who I don't think is here. Uh, my committee, Olga, Julius, and Augusto, thank you for uh, reading through the thesis and uh, for being here today. Um, for my colleagues at the ME Lab and uh, the Department of uh, Architecture, Design, and Media Technology, my co-authors, and all of you, my family and friends, for uh, being here today. Uh, here are some references and main publications throughout the thesis. And uh, thank you. That was it. Uh, you asked about Stefan, he's listening. He's ah, listening. great. So Good morning. Can... <laughs> <laughs> and I would say that in this case, we could go to the break a little bit earlier. Uh, please remember, if you have questions, uh, please find me and hand out the questions to be asked in the, in the second part. And uh, enjoy the coffee break then. Everything should be ready, but it's not. <laughs> Uh, more technical so there's something else to to check. Is he calling more than coffee sound? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How long is the break? It is 15 minutes. But now it's 17 minutes with two minutes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs>
the equations are discretized there. Uh, so I think that there is where the simulation comes in. Um, so all these techniques that I, uh, so the digital wave guys, model synthesis, uh, mass spring, finite difference, and a lot of others that I didn't mention, I believe that that is like, the, a simulation would be, uh, in my eyes, a, um, uh, let me think, um, should be something like a physical process that we, we digitize in a way based on what is actually happening, what is physically happening. And that could be for physical instruments, but also virtual analog devices, for example. So simulating a circuit in that sense. So that, that would be my, uh, my definition. Okay, so it's uh, what I normally tend to define more like modeling for interactive modeling in, in a way. Right. So we, we probably have the same kind of view of the world in that sense. Um, so right. uh, what, what I was trying to understand, especially in, in the, at the beginning of the presentation, is why the choice? Because uh, obviously you decided to take a very big challenge in using uh, uh, finite differences uh, for modeling instruments. I, I mean, I'm saying this because we have a laboratory in uh, Cremona where uh, it's called the Musical Acoustics Lab, where right. what we do is to study um, uh, historical instruments, Stradivarius, or Guarneri del Gesù, uh, whatever it is, but we, we work on these yeah. instruments. And of course, our goal is to understand what makes them so special somehow, and maybe try to understand how to suggest the luthiers, how to reproduce that. It seems to me that your goal is slightly different from that. Your, uh, because our goal is more like in the simulation domain, while you seem to be going in the, in the modeling domain in that right. sense. So uh, gotcha. wh why the choice of, of, uh, of the finite differences in that sense? You mentioned a few things. You mentioned uh, generality and flexibility. You mentioned... Uh, uh, that you have no assumptions. You mentioned the fact that it's a modular approach and uh, the price to pay is stability and cost. Well, you just proved that cost is, is not that much of an issue because you know working with dynamic grids and all these things uh, allow you to get around it and actually obtain uh, very, very convincing uh, musical instruments that play uh, very, I mean, with no delay, basically, no, no discernible delay, uh, and therefore allow, they allow you to do simulation on the fly. So the, the, why embarking into that kind of situation? Because you are still working on imitative synthesis, it seems to me, with the possibility of stretching the parameters to beyond the, the natural limit of uh, physicality. Uh, did, did I understand correctly? If so, uh, can you explain why you ruled out other solutions? Because you, you may, because it seems to me one of the things. Sorry, I didn't formulate the question the way I wanted to. But <laughs> you mentioned, for example, that uh, uh, nonlinear aspects are <coughs> crucial in the modeling, uh, and that it becomes particularly uh, it becomes a problem in uh, in. Uh, with specific solutions based, for example, on model synthesis or waveguide or wave digital in general and so on. But then the examples that you bring actually are addressed also in the literature of the digital waveguides and this sort of thing. So I was wondering uh, what led you to uh, approach the problem from the uh, finite difference domain? Right. I think there is a lot of potential to, to uh, actually add these nonlinearities <clears throat> or add these time varying aspects uh, to these, these finite differences, which is harder to do with other techniques. Um, so, yeah, all of my, the resonators that I implemented um, individually, they are, uh, they are linear. So if we take uh, a slip string or a 1D wave um, individually, it is also much easier to model it, for example, with waveguides, where with the stiff string, the stiffness can be modeled using all pass filters with waveguides, for example, or with model synthesis, where we stretch the, stretch the harmonics. But as you say, when you go into uh, more nonlinear systems, and uh, so th it's, it's, it's harder to extend um, the, uh, the other techniques to nonlinear or to more uh, realistic uh, simulations uh, than it is with finite differences. Because I think the, the finite difference schemes are very, uh, because they directly discretize these, these partial differential equations, there's very few assumptions, as, as you mentioned, I mentioned. Um, so it's, it's very close to the physical parameters. So it's very also easy and intuitive to control these. Um, 
And I think, if, if, for example, if you want to change the stiffness or the material density, there's just one parameter that you change instead of a series of all-pass filters and needing to figure out how to tune these. Um, so I think it's, it's also because the, the math is not necessarily straightforward, but the description is uh, compared to other maybe more physically inspired techniques. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in, uh, in this case, uh, it seems to me that the, 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 the presence of the nonlinearity team tends, if you um, consider these linear structures, uh, resonating structures, uh, at the end, uh, you concentrate most of the nonlinearity in the interaction point. So in the area where there is yeah. friction, where there is hammering, where there is basically it, it's all all about the nonlinear interaction, which exactly. seems to be the, the, the essential point for keeping a stable orbitating condition that generates the sound. Because uh, we, we all know that when we have a linear system and we try to make it oscillate, we are yeah. at, the, at the boundary of stability, yeah. and therefore any small changes will either make it die out or make it explode. So yeah. you need some sort of a sliding mode uh, type of nonlinear system control uh, that allows you to keep the, the, the oscillation stable. This is an aspect that, that that uh, seems to be kind of grazed by the thesis, but not uh, delved in uh, in uh, in consideration with more depth. Because you you had a uh, an interesting chapter, in chapter eleven on connections, and uh, um, which probably is the area where we should focus on the nonlinear interaction between parts. So the, the your choice, if I understand correctly, was not really to try to build a Lego-like system where you <laughs> assemble parts together, or you become the, the luthier of the situation and build your own instrument, but rather you move in the direction of uh, uh, studying existing instruments and stretching them beyond their limits. Did I understand correctly? Uh, yeah, I guess that's that's part of it. Actually, my current uh, project that I'm working on is to get all these modular uh, uh, linear systems as such and connect them in various ways, because that is also a very nice um, a possibility that we now have um, to, to connect them with either rigid, linear, or nonlinear connections and be the luthier and be the, be the instrument builder. Uh, but for the most of the projects uh, that I did, um, was to, to the first few papers, papers A and B, they were um, the settings of this modular environment that are inspired by um, the hurdy gurdy, the Dolchimer, and the Bode sitar, which I didn't show, um, and other instruments as well. Um, but, but there's no reason why we couldn't take it beyond that and, and make arbitrarily, um, arbitrary instruments and arbitrary configurations uh, between all these, uh, these components. Great, thank you. Um, another, st I'm still at the zoom out kind of uh, yes, situation. Of course, of course. So uh, the, the other aspect that uh, um, I'm not sure whether you mentioned it and which is very relevant as far as I'm concerned is to think of uh, simulation in this case or, or at least dynamic simulation, some modeling that that is kind of overlapped have very heavily with, uh, with simulation as an operation you can do in the loop, meaning that it's so fast, it's so interactive that you can actually use it for optimizing a process for uh, the design of musical instruments. So instead of thinking of working on a synthetic musical instrument and interacting with that, you choose to use that in order to optimize existing musical instrument without mm -hmm. having to build them in advance. Right. Uh, um, is this something that you also considered, or you just uh, your goal was really to focus on uh, uh, virtual musical instruments in that sense? And why not the first choice? Um, I think it just never crossed my mind uh, because um, I actually just learned about these uh, Yamaha instruments that are these these brass-like instruments that are yeah. made by physical modeling uh, or actually modeled in software. Uh, where they were afterwards physically printed because of the, or, or they had some uh, virtual timbre, I suppose, which you could model and put here yourself, and then print it in real life. Uh, and that is actually very interesting, but I only learned about that not too long ago, yeah, um, yeah. and realized that this is a very interesting field as well. 
Yeah, well, um, I went to yeah. visit. I went to visit Yamaha at Hamamatsu, and they showed me the simulation right. that they did in that case. And it took about a month to do just the simulation. Oh. So <laughs> that's the reason why I'm I'm raising the question because yeah. the the grid space has to be so small in that case that the simulation time is is uh, prohibitive, and so yeah. the design takes a long long time. So uh, yeah. using the techniques that you explained, probably that would be the best use in that case. Yeah. Um, so. Here comes the other question because it connects to this. Um, how about surfaces and 3D uh, grids? How easy would it be to extend your dynamic grid uh, modeling to multidimensional uh, situations? And uh, how would you, I mean, broad terms, how would you go about expanding in that direction? Yeah, that's a very good question. And that's something that I've been thinking about a bit. Um, I think if you would like to extend it to the 2D or maybe the 3D waveguide, I think it should be uh, well, relatively straight, uh, straightforward because you only have one neighboring grid point in each direction. Uh, so supposedly you could have, instead of one virtual grid point with two one-dimensional systems connected, you could have a kind of a row or a column of virtual grid points where two slabs are connected of a 2D system. Um, I did not try this yet, so maybe my assumptions are too... Uh, <laughs> I underestimate the, uh, the difficulty there, but um, I think that that, that should be, um, an, an, it, it could be extended in that way, so to, to slice the system, if it's 2D, 3D, 1D, doesn't matter, in two, and then um, apply it there. Um, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, it makes perfect sense to me. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you is uh, something that you actually addressed in the thesis, and I was wondering, I'd, I'd like to hear your voice about it, because um, uh, your main contribution in the thesis is this dynamic uh, grid approach, which I found extremely, I mean, very fascinating. And um, I'm just uh, um, wondering if what kind of strategy do you have in mind in order to, you know, somehow assess the stability and uh, mm. how to go about uh, proving the stability, because it seems to yeah. me that it's a very crucial aspect in case you wanted to expand that into a journal article at the end. So I, you proposed a little bit of a possibility, but perhaps it would deserve a little bit of expansion there. Of course, of course. Expansion. Yeah, so I think that, uh, well, I mentioned in the thesis this frozen coefficient analysis, which, which says that if at uh, every single configuration of the grid frozen, it is stable, the system, it should also be stable in the time varying case. I think at least under slow varying conditions. Um, it, it, I, I did make some steps. I tried to do uh, energy analysis to analytically get um, the energy at this connection point. But I, I got this close, but, but it's, it's not there yet. Um, maybe an uh, alternative discretization of the, uh, the connection forces. So for example, what we have if we uh, discretize a linear spring using an averaging operator to make it inherently stable, um, rather than just purely discretizing it and not knowing whether the energy is uh, positive definite. Um, but yeah, so maybe something like that, but I'm, I'm not sure if that would work because it's, the systems are connected by virtual grid points, which is not really a conventional uh, thing to do, I suppose. Um, what I did find during all these analyses is that um, in, in this frozen coefficient state, the, the energy of the system does not change. So there is no loss of, of energy through interpolation, which was very interesting to me. Uh, so that, that also um, shows that there is, that, that there is some uh, expression <coughs> that, that proves that the energy can stay zero or stable. Um, I just have to find it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm ju I was just wondering because the other aspect that you mentioned there is when you short, I mean, when, when uh, the, the, point gr the grid of points uh, begin to overlap backward, in that case, you, you have, it seems to me that there is a little bit of the same mechanism that you encounter in shock waves or in uh, some mm. sort of folding in uh, mechanical systems. Yeah. And this, this folding is, seems to be pretty well addressed in the literature of mechanical simulation. I was wondering if you uh, grazed through that literature yourself and maybe found uh, what kind of conditions they tend to set for the simulation of those situations. 
Uh, no, I have not seen that literature. I'm, I'm excited to hear that there is literature on this, this folding. Uh, um, there and, isn't, uh, not that I know, but I okay. remember that the, the, the problem of shock waves is, yeah. uh, is very much uh, studied in the literature and uh, even some chaotic system uh, show up due to that kind of uh, representation. But there is some sort of a, it seems to me that there could be some sort of a generalized yeah. uh, condition that you can uh, uh, set in order to avoid foldings in that case. And uh, I was wondering if you, uh, if you happen to have seen anything in that direction, but you already answered that. So thanks. No, no, but, uh, but I'll definitely take a look. That uh, sounds very cool. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, moving on to uh, the, the last aspects that I wanted to, to hear your voice about is the uh, interaction, which, uh, which of course is uh, probably one of the most fascinating aspects. And one of the things that physical modeling allows is also tactile feedback, uh, because you do have a force feedback that you can use. And uh, there is a disarming lack of devices that allow you to uh, feel the, the, the force feedback and, uh, and the tactile feedback in general. I was just wondering if, uh, if you envision uh, in, the, in the near future with the technology we've seen so far, and you seem to have seen a lot of that, uh, and make this sort of approach promising rather than using the physical thing, the real thing. Um, yeah, uh, all the attempts uh, that have been made so far are, all go in the direction of very limited type of, uh, of uh, interaction devices that probably wouldn't make, uh, that, that turn out to be more like toys than actual musical instruments for musicians. So I was wondering what your view is in general on that forefront. Yeah, it's a, it's a very hard question, and I think that that is also the reason why uh, there's no, not a big number of devices yet already available. Um, it, it really also depends on the interaction with the instrument that you're trying to model. Of course, you're not restricted by the form or shape of the instrument, but if you want to have direct haptic feedback for a guitar interaction, for example, you would almost, uh, I think uh, Martin von Alstein, he had some research on having this hybrid virtual acoustic instrument where you have a string uh, tensioned but very damped, so you could use the string as an excitation for the physical model, so it's, it could control the physical model using a physical string, but you would only hear the model and not the string itself. Um, and I think that that is a very good solution to um, have the physical object still there, because if you're if you're going to try and make it virtual with all kinds of mechanics, or maybe magnets and gloves, or, or I don't know, <laughs> uh, that's going to be, uh, it's first of all, going to break very quickly, I think. Uh, secondly, I don't think it will give the same experience as the, as the real thing. Um, so possibly it's, it's best to use part of the real instrument um, as a controller for um, the, uh, the physical model, just like a digital keyboard is for a piano as such. Yeah, you, you just anticipated my following question, so yeah, thank you for doing that. <laughs> Obviously, it, it's always... It always goes to that point. I mean, uh, mm. having the real thing and maybe using the real thing in order to control something that goes beyond the real thing. And then yeah. that's a very good way of doing things. And what about uh, extended reality, <coughs> virtual reality, and so on? Because in this case, virtual reality is no longer enough. You need to have more like a hybrid situation where you actually yeah. think in terms of uh, extended realities. Um, have you, uh, so in that case, you need a bi-directional interaction with, uh, with the reality. So sensing becomes important on the real instrument and uh, rendering becomes important in the real, in uh, the real place. So uh, the, the, the last aspect therefore would be how do you do the radiation? How do you, you generate the sound using the surfaces, the interaction between the vibrating surfaces and the, the, the space that surrounds you? Um, do you also envision solutions that go in that direction? Uh, hmm. so, so that you have vibrating objects in the real world that interact with virtual objects. Is that what you mean? Or is it that? No, I, I, because that is actually related to the choice of finite differences. So when you choose to go for finite differences, uh, it become, the interaction between the vibrating surface and the, and the volume of air surrounding it becomes particularly 
you know, um, involving because you have yeah. to yeah. consider single points. For example, having a system that that deals with modes of vibration mm -hmm. allows you to uh, use, for example, simplified models for the interaction with the uh, in-air interaction. And uh, for example, you can use uh, spherical harmonics that are connected to the, the modes of vibration in specific areas of the, of the instrument itself. So uh, the question could be in this case, is there a way to make uh, finite differences compatible with other representations that allow you more parsimonious interaction with the acoustic environment or with uh, radiation in space? Right. That you um, thought about. This is a very difficult question. I realized that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you don't, you don't have to answer. Don't feel guilty if you don't. But no, no, maybe I, you I thought can, uh, about it. Maybe you <laughs> thought about it. Uh, I don't know, but I can do an attempt. Um, there, there is a way to to go from finite differences to to modal synthesis, at least in the linear case, uh, where you represent it as a series of modes. Like for example, uh, twenty nine or thirty points on your one wave equation can be expressed in thirty modes as well. So perhaps you can use this this kind of uh, change in representation of the exact same system uh, in order to make use of these uh, these techniques for radiation that you that you mentioned. Um, yeah, but as I said, I did not <laughs> did not think about it's that. It's actually very interesting. I, I I like this idea. I think it could be an, an interesting direction of exploration because physicality. Yeah. Uh, also, I mean, the immersion in uh, the, the um, being immersed in the sound field is an essential part, and uh, being exposed to the directional variation it makes the instrument much more believable. When you hear the recording of a musical instrument, is very different from when you actually stand in front of it for various reasons because the radiativity, the, the radiation pattern is very, very complicated at high frequency, then the coloring is, is one yeah. of the part of the experience. So I think then you also have to think about how like all of these systems are just a single polarization or just a single state. And if you're gonna model that with a 3D acoustic uh, room, for example, and you want to connect the two, you also need to take, I think, other polarizations into account uh, of that same system in order to have a proper connection between the two. So that will also improve or increase the computational complexity again. Um, so yeah, it's, it's to, to do that exactly one-on-one, -on -one, I think you need a full 3D representation of your original instrument. Um, and otherwise, maybe an impulse response would be enough, uh, at least for the time being, uh, for a real-time implementation. Indeed, indeed. Um... I'd like uh, to ask one last question. I know I, I'm kind of going uh, overboard with uh, this time, so I don't want to steal too much time from uh, Julius. Um, it, this is a thesis where you covered a lot of ground, uh, really a lot of ground. And uh, uh, it seems to me that there is enough material to do a truckload of new things with that. So I'm just wondering how you're planning to wrap things up. So what is the, the next step? I know that you're done with the thesis, but you know, one like to you know, tie the knots and, uh, and, uh, yeah. and pick up all the pending threads and so on. So what is your plan for, for, the, for the closing down of the whole thing? <laughs> if, if it even wants to close down, uh, because I don't no, think- I mean, ever, at least on your side, at least on your <laughs> yeah, side. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I really want to continue to work on the, on the dynamic grids uh, and just, just extend that to, to, to more systems. And I think, of course, there are some loose ends with uh, the other instruments, like the, the, the Hurdy Gurdy, for example, was just an instrument inspired by that. But we can, uh, now that I know more about collisions, we can um, in, improve the model using um, like the rattling, like if you uh, turn the wheel a little harder, you can have a, a kind of a rhythm box in your uh, in your hurdy gurdy. So that would be a nice addition to that model. Um, but I, but I'm not planning uh, to do that. Um, I'm more planning to go into the the actually the modular VR uh, direction with the, the the current project that I'm working on. Um, but in the future, possibly, I think if if I could choose, I would I would work more on the on the dynamic grids um, okay. in that sense. And uh, pretend now for a second that you are a mad scientist. Uh, <laughs> it, what kind of a vision would you propose to the universe that surrounds you in terms of uh, theoretical generalization of what you've done? 
I'm sorry. Could you ask that again? <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I, I was just trying to make you suffer for a few minutes. Before. Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> um, no, I mean, <laughs> um, you know, we all have this, this uh, you know, moment in which we would like to be to build a, a grand theory around what you yeah. what we've done. And so, if you if you for a moment put the head on of the mad scientist, what would you envision as a possible theoretical extension of what you've done, rather than focusing on the the individual models? I think just being able to freely um, like modify any virtual instrument that you have. So you have your guitar, and in real time you can stretch it and, and, and mold it into a different instrument, like into a trombone that somehow allows the system to, to, to do that. Um, and, and just have all the, the acoustics and the scenarios in between, uh, where, for example, these neural networks that can morph between instruments to now have that, uh, instead of a black box, have that white box and know exactly what is going on physically, but have crazy hybrid sounds between the trombone and the, and the guitar, for example. Um, that would be amazing. <laughs> physical morphing. Physical morphing. Physical morphing. There we go. Well, thank you very much. I think I'll, I'll, I've already outstretched my my limit. So I again, I'd like to congratulate you for the thank you. Uh, the excellent presentation. <coughs> it was really pleasant. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Julius. So now it's your time. Please <laughs> go on. Hi, um, yeah, I also, um, well, can you hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> oh, you could have a check. Uh, let me know if I'm uh, too loud or something. I can move my mic away. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, I also really enjoyed your presentation. I really enjoyed your thesis and the papers. Um, really nice systematic approach to so many things, you know, um, so many systems. Um, you know, finite differences, you know, energy balance, you know, just really nicely laid out and very, very good writing. You're um, really definitely in the top ranking uh, of writers. <laughs> I've read a lot of dissertations Thanks. in my day. And uh, you really are a very, very good communicator. And I hope you, whatever you do, you do a lot of that because you really, okay. have, <laughs> that's really, really great. <clears throat> um, so, I guess I first want to basically just you know follow on some of what Augusto was talking about. Um, I think the most interesting one um, is uh, this idea of um, how to show stability of an adaptive grid using, let's say, you know, um, cubic interpolation. Um, and so the idea that that just popped into my head listening to that was that um, you know we use a lot of uh, Lagrange interpolation uh, for fractional delay filtering, right? You know about that. Yeah. So and and that and we use that in string loops without any trouble, and it, so it never harms stability in that case. And why? It's because the frequency response is bounded by one. It's one of the few interpolation schemes that just spontaneously guaranteed not to give you any gain. Um, you you can you'll get a little loss sometimes, but but that's okay. You know um, for stability, uh, and so. It seems like you might be able to apply that if you can find some way to decompose the, uh, the, the interpolation in the finite difference context into a superposition of traveling waves and then show that you, what you've got basically is uh, cubic interpolation of the traveling wave components, which are individually stable so that when you add them back together. So if you can do some kind of superposition of uh, traveling waves analysis, that might pull it in. I don't know. I mean, it's just a, a wild idea at two in the morning. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not scientists. So anyway, yeah. it's just like, yeah, it's one of those things. You know, you, you wake up in the middle of the night in a dream and you write it down. And you, the next morning you read, what? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. The, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, you know, I just, I don't know. Now, now I, you know, I have to go, you know, try to figure this out myself too. But, um, but if I, <laughs> but I figure it out, you know, it's, 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 it's all yours. Um, BSD license. Um, so <laughs> let's see what else. Um, yeah, and it's also dovetails to the uh, uh, question that Augusto was answering, uh, asking about, you know, zooming out um, wide finite differences to such an extent, and I completely. Agree with your uh, answer about the generality uh, in, in upwards compatibility with nonlinearities and so on, but 
you know, for almost all practical string simulations in, in most woodwinds, um, most of the time, you get these nice long straightaways where is linear time invariant, and you can set lambda equals one. You can get this nice exact solution to the wave equation. You can ignore stiffness. Um, it's it's like most of the time you can get away with you know that nice simple case where you know the waveguide approach is a lot more efficient. And Definitely. so, and, and if you can do adaptive grids, then I know you can connect a waveguide to a finite difference scheme, right? Um, and, and, and there are papers on that, you know, the, there are various papers on the adapters, um, but it's also extremely elementary. You can just, you know, um, make the sum of the traveling wave equal the, you know, the pressure on the other side. You know, it's like, it's, it, so, so have you considered that or is it just like, but, but I do see how it would, you know, detract from the elegance of your thesis where everything's finite differences, everything's analyzed, analyzed a certain way. It, it really matches the juice framework where everything's done in exactly a certain way. <laughs> so uh, maybe, maybe it's just an aesthetic. May, so anyway, let me, tell me what you th I, I, Just at least you know, talk about that issue and tell me what you thought about it. Yeah, so uh, yeah, as you say, the uh, digital wave guys are very efficient. But I think like, if, you, uh, if you have the system in isolation, then uh, you can get away with a lot. You can get away with uh, also even adding stiffness, as I said, with, uh, with these all-pass filters. Um, but once you start connecting individual systems, then this dispersion kind of, for example, as an, uh, as an example of an effect that, you, that doesn't uh, assume traveling waves, uh, instead of having that lumped in digital waveguides, here it's now distributed. Um, so the, the interaction between two systems um, will, will include this dispersion in a correct way, which is also physical. Um, but yeah, that, that is one thing. Um, yeah, I think the, uh, yeah, just, Exactly as you say, like it's 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 more elegant to have one one technique and the computing power we have now to have um, these systems run in real time and, and right now there's not a lot. Uh, I mean, there's maybe on the on the ground level there's a lot of difference between uh, just having a circular buffer running or uh, having a full wave or a find a different simulation. Um, but yeah, the, the 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 models can be run in real time right now. And I think that uh, especially the connection between various components and, and including every single effect, if you want to have that in waveguides, you're almost back to finite different schemes or even worse, perhaps. And with finite different schemes, you have the, the advantage of having all the parameters exposed. You have a very easy control. And if you need to tune all your all passes, that is going to be uh, quite hard, at least from, from, what, I've, uh, from what I know. Um, yeah. Yeah, it can, it can be a pain to redesign the all passes, but... But how often do you need those all passes? So that's the case where stiffness must be simulated. So when when are those cases? Um, I mean, it's famously necessary for piano strings down low, but you know what other cases? I mean, for the guitar, it's usually not audible, right? Am I, uh, so so tell me the cases you know of where stiffness is actually needed in the model. Yeah, so that would indeed be for, for thicker strings, like the thicker the string is, the more stiffness, the more inharmonicity. Um, I guess if we, if we would um, give the, the user full freedom to change all the parameters and go from a string to a bar, that is also where you need the more stiffness, I suppose. Uh, so just this, this freedom and this, this um, better control over the parameters and also user friendliness. Um, I think there's the, there's the more potential in the in the finite difference representation than uh, being even though waveguides are more efficient, you are constricted by by its uh, the, the way that the representation is, I suppose. Well, if you had a digital waveguide in a certain state, how hard would it be? Do you think to initialize a finite difference scheme to that state to prepare it to turn into a bar? <coughs> Wait, what? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so you start you start with a an ideal string, let's say. Yeah. Okay. And and you're simulating it with a delay line and, and almost no computation. But now you want it to become a bar, an ideal vibrating bar. So it's going to become a stiff string and then a bar. Yeah. So yeah. so the first thing you want to do is when the stiffness becomes audible, you want to switch from a digital waveguide representation to a finite difference scheme that is stiffness ready. Or, or maybe you, you know, start with a little all-pass. Maybe you start adding a few all-pass sections until it gets annoying, and, and now you want to switch 
Now you want to switch to a sudden, you know, um, a finite difference. Can you imagine just taking the state of a digital waveguide and initializing the state of a finite difference simulation? I suppose you could. Um, you would also need the, the velocity, of course, like the past state, but I suppose you could compute that from past values of the digital waveguide as well. Um, I suppose that could be possible, um, but wouldn't that be too much of a hassle to, to do this, do this uh, kind of interconnection between two different schemes? Um, then starting with the one, I, I know that this is a philosophical experiment, but <laughs> I guess that, that you, you, could, you could do that, but also you're, if you have it in a real-time application, then the moment you get to the bar, your CPU might shoot up. So there is some, some um, yeah, processing power that suddenly increases. So you might increase the latency with that, um, which, which might be uh, annoying or make the, uh, make the thing unplayable if you're switching between it uh, too much. And if you're, you're going between states, I suppose there needs to be some sort of interpolation. So you might lose some of the state or some of the data. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this it'll, be, it'll be annoying to go from 100 strings in real time down to only 12 strings in real time. Right. So awesome. users <laughs> might complain about that. So make them <laughs> suffer with finite differences all the time so that they don't realize it's possible to have any more. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. yeah, you don't want to, you know, give it and then have to take it away. That's true. Um, so another another question that came up while you were talking to El Gusto was um, the virtual reality scenario, and that's really interesting. I I'm just kind of curious about how that actually works. Um, are you going to be playing a normal controller in VR? H how does it actually? Because you know, my experience with VR is that there's really high latencies. Um, you know, it's kind of tied to the frame rate of a, of a video of some kind. So, you know, it just doesn't seem like a musical instrument scenario to me. So how do you make that work? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. I think, first of all, you would like the audio uh, engine or the audio thread to be completely separate from everything else. Um, so that, that is in C++, that is just embedded on the site. And then it's controlled from, from external, um, like the, the controllers or the user in, in virtual reality. Um, and I suppose that the uh, control might have some latency, especially with controllers in the air. But we, we've proven with the haptic device that you can have real-time control in virtual reality and that this, um, just the fact that you're in VR does not introduce any, or at least noticeable uh, latency, uh, which we tested with people. Um, so it's it's I think it's going to be hard to play instruments just using controllers in the air, and I think that that is also uh, what Augusto was pointing at. Like, how are you gonna um, get this haptic feedback of your actual instrument? So maybe a, a, another opportunity would be to use AR instead, um, where you have some physical props laying around, where you can have the haptic feedback, but still have this this extra uh, dimension of the virtual world um, on your headset. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, play real controllers in an augmented reality environment. Um, uh, that should do it, I would hope. Um, let's see. Um, I'm just looking at my. Uh, I, now I'm, I made it to my prepared questions um, based on reading your thesis. Um, oh, did you consider wave digital filters at all? Uh, no, I did not, unfortunately. And um, I've, I've seen some talks at DAFX about the wave digital uh, world, but I never uh, never took the time to go uh, to delve deeper into it. I know that Chumor has done some work on wave digital filters with waveguides, um, but no, I never I never went that path. Well, you can you can think of them as uh, finite difference solvers of a sort, and they are really nice with respect to um, boundary conditions because. Mm. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll mention uh, some work on reverberation. Um, Beeson was one of the authors, and uh, they've actually showed that um, that what you want to do is, you know, use a finite difference scheme, you know, the, the ideal lossless finite difference scheme for simulating um, air propagation, losslessly right up to the boundary, and then switch to a traveling wave model in order to reflect from the boundary instead of do the, um, you know, the the sort of uh, the points that go into the boundary that allow the finite difference scheme to continue in, uh, through the boundary. So um, I just thought I would mention that. Um, it's a really nice 
and it's yet another hybridization where you yeah. know you're willing to flip to the to the to the best model for the situation you're in. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're really good for boundaries. I'll just put a, put in a plug. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. I'm looking here. How it? Okay. So this is again back on stiffness. You know, we talked a little bit about when is it audible in. It's not audible very often, um, but um, there is another consideration in the case of bowed strings. It can affect bowed string dynamics. Have you, have you um, studied the effect of stiffness of the string on the, the bowed string dynamics? You know, the stick slip uh, yeah. behavior. Yeah. I, uh, it's a while ago that I started out with the 1D waveguide. And uh, bowing that with some damping, um, and then comparing that to a stick with stiffness. Um, I think when there's a nonlinearity involved, there there might be bigger effects of these maybe inaudible stiffnesses uh, in the strings. There might be a, because there is an extra um, restoring force in the system. It might uh, slip earlier than maybe the ideal one uh, D wave guide or one D wave equation. Uh, but but I've not. Um, experimented with that to, to that level or to that depth, how, uh, how stiffness affects the bow interaction. Yeah, one, one really important thing is that um, a stiff string will not form a corner, so oh. it's always more rounded because that, you know, the bending stiffness prevents the sharp corner formation. So it means that the when the string pulls away from the bow, it uh, it has a, a, a less sharp corner. So it, it holds down some of those highs. It gives you a, a more rounded right. corner. That's really valuable for the for the sound. And you have that kind of warm sound. You know, the uh, the uh, Tromba Marina really does have a nice warm bowed string yeah. sound that, that's really good. Oh, and speaking of that, I, I thought the bowed string sounded great, looked great, but the uh, rattling bridge sounded pretty artificial to me. It sounded kind of clacky, like it did not sound Natural. Did you feel like it needed more work? And if so, what what would you do? What do you think is the problem? And what do you think should be done? Uh, well, we, we uh, first of all get the state. Uh, we're listening to the state of the body at the collision location. Only that. So we get the pure audio output from where the bridge collides with the body, and then at the body uh, position. Um, so perhaps we could use an, uh, a slightly bigger area, so have kind of a uh, circular area around that point. To, uh, to get some of those highs again uh, out of it um, or, or use, yeah. So, so that is one, one part, I think. Uh, maybe the, because the collision is also point to point. So there's also not a, a distribution as uh, such. So we, uh, we are just using point to point contact. It's the same with the bow, actually. It just has one specific point instead of the distribution. So all these, all these distributions might, uh, or the point to point is kind of unphysical. So you need, more of these distributions to make the sound more, I guess, uh, smoother and maybe even more uh, realistic. That sounds exactly right to me. Good. Uh, let's see. Oh, um, you mentioned the, this was interesting when I was reading your thesis, that you mentioned the iterative Jacobi method for fast matrix inverse for implicit methods in this nice section you had on implicit methods. Yes. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> it, so that made me think, well, hey, if you're willing to do something iterative, you could use a Newton iteration. And, and, and if you're doing a Newton iteration, you could be doing a nonlinear problem, right? So, um, so there's this interesting now continuum between you know, implicit linear methods and the full-blown nonlinear solvers that we see in, um, in, the, in the frontier models. So have you, have you noticed that or thought about that? Did you think at all about Newton iterations? Um, because how many iterations do you give the Jacobi method? What if you only gave that many iterations to the Newton solver? We know that you don't need very many Newton iterations to update a nonlinear um, problem. Oh. Uh, well, to be honest, I, I, uh, <laughs> I let Stefan also read the thesis, and he said in my implicit scheme section, hey, but we can do this non or the iterative Jacobi method. Um, you might want to mention it. So I mentioned it, uh, but did not <laughs> look into it in depth. Uh, okay. But it is very promising uh, because our matrices are very, uh, are like mainly diagonal, so we can do this uh, more optimized uh, inversion, I guess. 
Um, but yeah, this because the nonlinear strings they also like require iterative or um, in, implicit schemes to be stable normally. Um, so this is a very like promising uh, promising thing. I don't know. Maybe maybe there's uh, a lot of literature already on that. But I did not look into the nonlinear uh, resonators too much. Yeah, it's it's a big direction. It really is. Um, yeah. And, and there's a fair amount of work on it already, so, but, um, but I think you're ready for that. I think that's where you are now. Okay, good. <laughs> it's been seasoned well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've got exactly the right foundation for going yeah. into that. <laughs> Great. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, so in the dynamic grids, um, you know, you had the, uh, the dispersion effects and the high partials, um, and... I would think that those would not be audible. Have you thought about, you know, the audibility of partials um, when they're up high like that? I mean, do you ever think about critical bands and and the audibility of uh, discrete partial tuning uh, at high frequencies? Do you ever well, think of um, yeah, as I mentioned in the paper, the uh, there are some some human sensitivity, frequency sensitivity limit around uh, 3,000 hertz and whatever is above there is like much less sensitivity than what is below. Um, so yeah, there's still listening tests needed to confirm that they're like the sound is smooth, especially with these very low um, low number of grid points. You really get these very visible uh, waves in the top parts of the spectrum. Uh, but when we go to systems that we usually model, there's many more modes, and these frequency deviations they they happen to a much uh, lesser degree as well. So those those um, it was just an illustrative example to show kind of zoom in into the partials. Um, but yeah, the, the, the top partial for like from 15 to 16 intervals was, I think, uh, detuned by 67 cents. So even the, the detuning is, is very, very little. Um, but yeah, this was just to show that in the ideal case, we would have perfectly linear lines going down if we decrease the wave speed. Um, but yeah, the, luckily, uh, the method shows that the, uh, the lower modes are, are much more linearly decreasing than the, than the higher ones, which means for perception, that's uh, good news, I guess. Yeah, it's very nice to see, you know, it just gives you some insight into what's going on to see that. Um, but, but the thing I always think about is that a bark band is roughly 20% of center frequency. So, so up to 200 hertz, they're, they're generally taken to be 100 hertz wide. And then above that, it's just you know, one-fifth of the frequency. So, um, and, then, and then you see that you get a lot of partials per critical band up high, and so once you have a lot of partials, then slightly retuning them is not going to matter because you're not resolving no. them. If they're, not, if they're not resolved, it's just a, it's just a, uh, it's a kind of a noise band. Um, although it has a texture that's not noise, you know, uh, the number of partials you need to make a band sound like noise is, is very large. But, but to hear the individual tunings, uh, no. you know, it, it's gone. So, um, yeah, that, that's just good to point. It's always good to point that out when you yeah. allow something to go on up there like that. You know, uh, you, you might want to say, you know, uh, yeah, we want to match the energy level because it could affect the, the sort of brightness presence. But, um, it is, you know, you can't hear it. Uh, it could also cause beating phenomena. And if there's any non yeah, that's what I thought. yeah, you could get some intermodulation that's very mm -hmm. audible, audibly modified down low. So, yeah, things can go wrong. They could. See, yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, so after I, I like how you're really interested in controllers, and it looks like you've evaluated a lot of them, um, and it looks like you've arrived at the sensor morph is the best. Would you, would you say that's the best one out there, or was there one even more expensive that you wish you had? <laughs> well, the sensors were available at the university, and uh, Stefani also said, let's, let's just go with this, and it's very, very easy to, uh, like, there's a nice API, nice documentation. Um, there was another controller that we were uh, willing to try, the Haply, which is, uh, I think, what the guys at the MI Creative, the mass spring systems, they are using for their interactions with their instruments. Uh, and that also gives haptic feedback. Um, so it's like this, this thing in two dimensions with this, um, yeah, kind of two arms that give give haptic feedback. So that one we we wanted to uh, we wanted to work with, but uh, we we couldn't get it to work. So um, unfortunate for them as well, I guess. Um, so we continue with the sensor, and the, um, the Omni is very nice because it has this haptic feedback, and that is kind of what I missed with the sensor. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's always there's always a trade off. If you have like moving parts, things will break very easily, and the sensors are really really robust. 
Um, so, so in that sense, it's a very good uh, controller. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's really amazing. Um, um, okay, so um, my last uh, question is uh, sort of zooming out, you know, big sky prediction. Um, what, what, what are the, the realism limits that you feel you have? In other words, where do you feel blocked and where you need more? You mentioned a few things like that. And, um, and then within the uh, framework you have, how far beyond physical have you explored or have imagined? That's my last two-part question. I guess that's a two-part question. Right, so the realism first, I suppose. Um, because I think that, that many of these systems, they have uh, one, one translational degree of freedom. Uh, and whereas in the real world, you have these uh, three-dimensional, well, everything is three-dimensional in the real world, I suppose. So you get all these nonlinear effects, uh, which you could model in, a, in one dimension, of course, as well. But I guess, like, th then, yeah, to go fully physically real, everything has to be um, placed in 3D and also be able to move in 3D. Um, but I think, as I also say in the conclusion of the thesis, we can uh, approximate a lot of this stuff down to, to a simpler algorithm that still perceptually sounds very real, I would say. Um, so I think that a lot of these um, like listening tests or like how, how different like an alternative force choice, like what sounds real, what does not, um, could, could like put, a, put kind of a limit or, or kind of where, where is this gray zone of where it becomes real and where it sounds synthetic. Um, yeah, so I think that there's a lot of evaluation there also needed. Um, but, but I guess my point is that you don't need a full 3D physical representation of your system in order to make it sound real. Um, for example, the, the sit string simulation already, like in isolation, sounds very much like a string. I, I would say. Uh, but, um, <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the second part of your question, uh, could you repeat that? Um, going beyond known physics or, you know, pushing these models to places where no real model has gone before. <laughs> I mean, I guess that is kind of a similar answer to what I gave uh, Augusto, like to be really able to um, take this virtual instrument and bend it, kind of circuit bend your, uh, your physical model in ways that are physically impossible, but give this very, very nice timbres that are not possible in the real world, because that is also a very big argument for why, I guess, we would do physical modeling. Uh, and not only be restricted by real instruments, because why not pick up the real instrument, um, but, but really have this, this full potential of now having the software uh, virtually and being able to do whatever with it uh, as you wish. <laughs> and I, I think that it actually is the right place for musical instruments to evolve, because once, once we do our job and make everything sound exactly like the original only free of noise and free of limitations, then the question becomes, what did we want, to, where do we want to take it, where do we want it to go? Do we want these strings to be bigger or, or fatter, or do we want more of them, or do we want them to vibrate in more dimensions? You know, there's just this unboundedness that, you know, the uh, luthiers of the last few centuries, uh, you know, we don't have those boundaries anymore. And so, oh, right. we, you know, we can very, very seriously think, what's next in a way that's never been possible. Uh, and, and we can take a while though, we should pause and take a victory lap and enjoy our perfect <laughs> physical instruments. But, you know, there is going to be a next evolution. We just have to, you know, wait and see, you know, the next genius luthiers, uh, what they come up with. Yeah, definitely. Because I think also a lot of this is in the hands of the, 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 creat the creatives the creative people who are going to use this software, maybe to extents that like none of us have even talked about. So um, it's very exciting. And, and one of the big advantages of a, of a physical paradigm is that it speaks with a, with a characteristic voice that's right. very easy to lose using other methods. You know, having basically grown up with computer music, you know, I know how easy it is to make a sound that nobody has any idea what it is. <laughs> Most sounds are like that. <laughs> Those sounds don't communicate anything. They just sound like, okay, so you got another noise. That's nice. Um, Great. <laughs> but it's nice, to have, it's nice to have a class of sounds that kind of grabs you in a certain way and 
grabs your recognition, grabs your entire lifetime of experience, and you know what it's saying. It, it, it opens up this huge, vast vocabulary built up over decades of your life. And you can speak in that vocabulary. Uh, and, and having that rich communication base is, is hard to find by other methods, in my opinion. Right. But, but they are growing. You know, the virtual analog is developing its own you know, palette. You know, there, there are other palettes that are growing along as well. But um, you know, the physical world is a big one, a big source of them, <laughs> not to be ignored. But you're supposed to be answering the questions. So um, and I'm over time. So uh, but, but that, I just had to, uh, well, so, you know, I, you're preaching to the choir with me. So that's just how it is. So um, I'll, I'll now defer. <laughs> Uh, but thank you very much, and uh, please keep writing and keep doing things. Keep mowing down all obstacles in your path to, to do <laughs> what you think should be done, because you get it done, and, it's, and, and, and the world needs it. Please keep going. Thanks, Julius. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, okay, so now it's my turn to grill you. And before I start, I have to say I am not in sound and music computing <laughs> field at all. But I'm a control engineer by basic education, so I should know something about physical system modeling. And so my questions will be somewhere there. I'd like to join congratulations that you already got. Excellent presentation. I really learned quite a lot. Awesome. And I'm very happy with how the situation is evolving until now. So, uh, when you said uh, modeling physical instruments and you show that um, photograph of a guitar and then that pixelated guitar, I said yes, that is what I can understand. <laughs> what we can model means omitting quite a lot of fine details. And then Professor Sarti said that basically one of the tasks they are having in their uh, laboratory in Cremona is to try to understand by modeling how the, what is that what makes the perfect Stradivari the perfect Stradivari. Yeah. And then basically I'm missing the link <clears throat> because that last quality must be in some details that are in that that are omitted in that pixelated right. image. So in fact I would like you to talk something about constraints and those effects that your method by its nature left unmodeled. Right. Um, I think to to come from a, a real life instrument back to, to virtual, I suppose if you do really the simulation rather than the modeling, I think a big uh, obstacle there would be, uh, well, first of all, measuring exactly how, for example, the Stradivarius has been played for, for a long time and the wood has like maybe bent in a certain way such that its sound is very unique. But this is very hard to measure, very hard to uh, kind of decompose and apply to, to a model. And I think that the, the models that I present in the thesis, they, um, they're also quite a bit simplified. So for example, these um, uh, kind of weirdly shaped geometries is also very hard to do with finite differences. So uh, we mostly assume a single one dimension or two two dimensions. You can see that the instrument you model, it's much simpler. Yeah, exactly. So so we, we actually approximated this uh, the instrument body, which is 3D, to a 2D plate. And it's not even perfectly 2D, it's kind of trapezoidal. So I think that if you really want to go towards uh, real life instrument simulation uh, back into the virtual world, you would need some like finite element methods, for example, or uh, do some uh, measurements of the modes of the system, which I guess is, is kind of similar in a way. Um, so, so that is uh, kind of this bottom up framework of finite differences might, um, or is, is, is more of the bottom up approach than being able to simulate whatever is in the real world like, perfectly as such. Um, I hope that answers part of your question. Yeah, at least. Good. Uh, then you also mentioned friction. You have those equations when you have friction. Friction is insanely hard to model. Right. What did you do? <laughs> what did you do? Um, so, so, well, first of all, I took the static friction model from uh, Stefan Bobao's book. 
and um, like experimented with that in real time. As I said, it was very uh, nice to hear um, the, the sound that the string produced when, when there's a human aspect to it, instead of just setting the force, setting the velocity, setting the position. Um, so already with the sense will be very expressive with this with this model. Um, so so that already surprised me that a simple or static friction model without these bristles or these hairs could already create such a sound. Um, and yeah, I should say the the elastoplastic friction model I think is is until now at least in musical acoustics is the, the most uh, involved one that uh, has been uh, has been done. Um, and yeah, I think I think. Uh, that that model is very compared to measurements. It's 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 very accurate. Um, but that is in, in other papers outside of uh, musical acoustics. Um, but yeah, as I said, there, like, if if I would have continued with the elastoplastic model, I don't think I would have been able to do the rest of the instruments after that because the parameters are just so hard to tune. And to be able to get a good sound out of it, you need an an, an extra person to uh, be there by your side. I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I think that you are supposing very correctly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so another thing is that I also got interested because it's a nightmare for control engineers. You said there at one point there are so many parameters to adjust. Any systematic method of adjusting them because basically what you're doing, you are trying to work with linear methods. Mm -hmm something that is by its nature non-linear. Yeah, exactly. So what are, uh, how to say, domains when those linear models hold and how can you go with adjusting them? Yeah, so that's a very good question because, um, well, for example, the string, like, I think what you could do is um, have a recording of some, some real friction or some, not maybe a recording, but some data of some, some physical process and somehow uh, maybe even using machine learning to, to get from info from the audio into the parameters and somehow train the parameters based on the uh, like the original audio. And of course, you also need a proper model of whatever you excite, so the string, for example. Or you just have a sensor on which you uh, go with or uh, apply friction um, and then um, adjust the parameters accordingly. And yeah, doing this by hand is very hard, but perhaps machine learning could be an intervention to uh, from the audio, from the spectrum, um, train these parameters like that. Yeah, maybe. Maybe, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then because we also have questions for the audience, mm -hmm. I just want to ask you uh, in direction what also Julius was asking. If you envision your method, main contribution of this thesis, and then you have that in 1D. You mentioned that already. How do you think that it can be extended to 3D? Yes. But, but uh, how to say, mention some of possibilities. You already did some, I just wanted to yeah. as a wrap up. So how much it can be expanded pretty easily? How much it can be expanded with, let's say, a little imagination? And where are the limitations that basically you have to add something? Yeah. Um, so I think that for, because the method is now been applied to the 1D wave equation, which like for the expanded update equation, you have this, this stencil that is just one uh, wide to either side. So you have two neighboring points that you need for the next one. So um, the, the next step for, for, for 2D, for example, you will have four neighboring points in this plane, which I think is still doable, but as I said before, it's like, I, I, I have not tried that yet. Um, in 3D, the same, that you have the 2D case and then two points above and below. Um, uh, I think that that is also still possible, but I think that the, the where you need more imagination is when you start to move towards a stiff string, for example, where the, the stencil is now of width uh, two neighbors to each side. So you don't have only one virtual grip point at the inner boundaries to take care of, but now you have two. So how are you going to get the values of those? Are you going to use an extra interpolation operation or do you do something else with more overlap? Um, I don't know yet. You will also have so many boundary points, not only two, meaning 3D, you get all those, uh, you know. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because in 1D you just have the, the, the boundaries at the end to take care of, but if you split your 2D system, then you have boundaries at your split, I suppose. Um, so how to handle those, that is also a, a good question. but. 
I hope to figure that out. Uh, you also said something that kind of surprised me. That was the first time I heard anybody saying that. Now we do have computing power. <laughs> I mean, everybody is always complaining. You know, uh, computers are becoming faster and faster. But now we're coming from computer graphics uh, area. Yeah. Our requirements are becoming more and more, even more detailed and demanding. Yeah. So here, I would suppose that uh, if you want those tiny details, could you still reach real time? Um, I think so. I mean, I think the difference with graphics is that the, the um, what we visually get, like if we see something pixelated, it's still OK. And you know, the old games, they are pixelated, but they're still playable. But if you have a such pixelated audio, where you have your audio rate instead of 44,100, which is human hearing limit. Mm -hmm. If you have it at um, 10K or even lower, then the sound is going to sound horrible. So I think with visuals, it is uh, less of a problem to kind of accommodate for the current computing power that we have than with audio. And I suppose that right now for these models, we, we reach the level that personal computers can handle audio rate simulations of at least these simplified systems that I uh, present. Yeah, I'm just uh, <laughs> curious of when you go to 3D and yeah. add some more details, exactly, yeah. you so would start wishing also. Definitely. Already the 2D model of the Trump Marina was super heavy and the string and the mass, they were very simple to model it when you go higher dimension. It's much, much more computationally intensive. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And. Uh, we have two questions from the audience, which actually will hopefully bring very nice discussion because it will address some of the things we discussed in the pre-examination and uh, didn't talk too much today. So the first question is, um, have you been able to also make music rather than demonstrating that with isolated tones? And while you're thinking about this, I think this is an excellent opportunity to also say hi to Stefan Bilbao, who is in the Zoom part of this and who conducted a project with musicians to make them make these models play as well and all the pointers as well. Thus, <laughs> he was secretly listening to all the <laughs> but he's a co supervisor and also co author reader of the thesis, as we heard in the iterative Jacobian uh, <laughs> discussion. So what would you say? Or uh, And then, Stefan, would there be anything to add about yeah. that? Uh, so I personally did not make any tracks or music with these, uh, these things. I think um, we, we've had some musicians come over from the Rhythmic Conservatory to test our implementations. And they did see some um, potential future uh, like music music generation uh, interaction and stuff but i didn't do myself i know like as you say stefan had his collaboration with real-time um, implementations of these physical models and composers um to kind of have this this dynamic to, uh, to actually make pieces and then maybe i don't know if that is true but maybe you tune the models to the composer's needs um but that that is definitely something to to maybe work towards and go more in the creative direction with these things rather than the mathematical uh, direction. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I, I, maybe Stefan can add something about his, uh, his project, but. <laughs> Stefan, would you like to? I just, uh, yeah, I don't want to add much. Uh, this is um, Sylvan's day. So, but I just wanted to say that, um, like Sylvan came along uh, at the time when we were just finishing all this work on um, kind of offline modeling. And we really wanted to try to move everything into real time. And we're sort of doing that now. But I mean, what Sylvan's done is exactly uh, the direction we wanted to go. And he's done some really like stuff I wish I'd gotten into myself, you know? But it's, uh, it was fantastic stuff. It was really great working with him. And um, I think it's a, a really great uh, thesis, too. So and that's all I'm going to say. So <laughs> thanks a lot, Stefan. <laughs> yeah, back to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. The second question, uh, the first question, are we satisfied with the answer? There is <laughs> some research, and uh, also Sylvan is aware of that direction, and there have been some experimentation on that, uh, but uh, that's a fruitful direction. 
So the, the second question is, first of all, congratulations for the clear pre presentation and valuable research. And I can imagine that other value of this real-time physical modeling is to add realism and versatility to music produced by artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithms. Can you elaborate your vision on this, uh, on this possible technological synergy? And that was the exact thing we discussed also about what's next and how we can turn the parameters in the pre-evaluation. So how do you relate your research to these possibilities, AI and machine learning? Yes, yeah, so, so one direction that uh, we talked about before was to tune the parameters using machine learning, but we can also control the models using machine learning, I suppose. Um, like the, there has been some movement in these uh, artificial intelligence generating uh, Nirvana songs or Beatles songs, which uh, which is pretty cool, but uh, I, th I think that there could be uh, a synergy there. I don't see why not. Uh, that rather working with audio files, we work with um, uh, the physical models directly. Um, yeah, and I don't see why not. Just give the, the model a lot of music to train on and try to control the model according to that music or just, um, yeah, it, it could be a very interesting, uh, interesting direction. Yeah. Nice. And uh, would like the opponents would like to elaborate and ask further questions on this future direction. Yeah. I think that's a good answer. Um, I think the uh, you can think of a physical model as a, a set of priors. So you know when you do machine learning, you have you, you want to condition on anything you can. You know the more you know, the better you're going to do. And so if you can force um, the um, estimation into a, a particular parameter space, then you're going to stay in that space and you're going to get the best results in that space. So when you know you're in that space, it's good to have that space. And so having a model of that space that you then optimize the parameters of is the best way to go. Um, and you probably heard about differentiable DSP, DSP, uh, the Magenta Group. That's a, I think that's a really great example. You know, you just put those mo uh, model parameters right in there with the neural net weights, and, and it's just one big, giant, stochastic gradient descent. But it's, it's constrained to have the form you know it must have. Right. And so machine learning will really run with that, and you'll need less data and fewer iterations to get your, your best results. Um, and, we, and we've seen a lot of examples of machine learning rediscovering classic signal processing the hard way. And, and once you see it doing that, then you can actually give it that structure and let it optimize that structure in sufficient generality that you can uh, get the same result as an end-to-end -end system can get. And you'll get there much faster with less data and less training time. Well. Uh, I tend to agree with Julius on that. And uh, as a matter of fact, it's one of the questions that we've been asking ourselves over here in, uh, in Milan. Uh, for quite some time now. Uh, I see two fronts where machine learning plays a very interesting role. One is indeed uh, to speed up uh, um, simulation in order to put it in the loop, it's something I mentioned before. Uh, we recently published an article on, uh, on nature scientific reports, uh, you know, using machine learning for uh, uh, ready simulation of uh, um, parametric shapes of violin board, uh, violin plates, which uh, gives a, a very high accuracy on the prediction of the modes of vibration, which is interesting because it, maybe so, some of the issues that you might encounter with uh, finite differences in multidimensional structures could be helped or complemented with the uh, solutions based on machine learning. The other aspect is indeed uh, an aspect related to sound synthesis, more modeling for sound synthesis, uh, something that actually we talked about a couple of days ago with Julius and, uh, and Olga as well, which is much more in the, in the, in the area of uh, control theory, uh, analysis, stability, and control of nonlinear systems. Um, finding which very small sub-regions of the parameter space actually uh, makes the system engage into an orbitation is, is really, really hard because it's a very, very tiny region in the parameter space. So uh, making sure that the system starts orbitating and producing a sound is not an easy feat. 
so there are very, very few results around. I mentioned the Bendixson theory, uh, theorem and so on, but the very, they, they only work with very, very small and simple systems. And the musical instruments are way beyond that level of complexity. <laughs> So maybe machine learning could help in that direction, understanding where the timbral space lies within the parameter space. So I, I feel that that will be an interesting area to go explore with machine learning. Great. Thank you. That was a very thorough answer to the question. Is that good? Yeah, great. <laughs> OK, I think with that, we come to the end of the this, this part. So after this, we will leave the jury and the chair person to evaluate the performance and write an assessment. And meanwhile, we'll be enjoying nice things that are prepared. I see them <laughs> for that. And we will invite it when their discussion is over and they're ready to, to uh, uh, come tell. They will come out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm still showing thumbs up or thumbs up. So thank you very much.